Good morning. Welcome to Oak Hills Church today. I hope everyone's doing well. How many of you uh, participated in uh, last night's Christmas festival? Was that fun or what? It was great. So glad to have you here this early this morning. You must have went to bed early then. All right. We're on the, uh, the second week of Advent. And um, as such, we're uh, celebrating the candle of expectation. Uh, just another reminder to you that in addition to um, our worship here this morning, you can also worship through, uh, um, through, a, through a community installation that we're going to be doing through, through uh, the end of Advent and into Christmas. So um, uh, Angela Hauk back there, he's, she's waving her hands. She's going to be uh, working on this uh, craft and you, you're going to be building um, a, a community of cool stuff. I don't even know how to explain it. But you can go back there at any time during the service. Um, and you don't have to be a child. This is for adults as well. And you can be a part of that. And that can be a part of your way of expressing worship as well today. Our call to worship is, Oh, come let us adore him. We're just going to sing that. So let's all stand together. And uh, turn our attentions to our Lord God. He is here waiting to meet with us as his people. Oh, come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy. For he alone is worthy, for he alone is worthy, Christ the Lord. We'll give him all the glory. We'll give him all the glory. We'll give him all the glory.
praise his glory by born that man no more may die born to raise the sons of earth born to give them second birth heart the herald angels sing glory to the new born king sing praise God together. Good morning. We are the Woodard family, lighting the second candle of Advent, representing expectation. The scripture reading is Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. 
How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her own old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Would you join me in our community prayer? Heavenly Father, precious Jesus, Holy Spirit, we're grateful to you for this new day that you have made. We're grateful to you for your presence with us, for your love and your care. And we marvel at the candle we have lit today, this candle of expectation for Advent. And our hearts long for the arrival of the Christ child, the one who would make all things right, the one who would purchase our salvation. We recognize the darkness that we sit in as our hearts yearn for this arrival, the longing within us for this Christ child, more than just a manger decoration, but the lover of our souls. And we are so incredibly grateful. Help us in this season, Lord, to push back against the busyness and the noise and activity that all comes with Christmas time. But to in the midst of those things, to be still and to listen, to listen for your voice and your invitation to anticipate with great joy and expectancy our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting Father, our Prince of Peace. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this most extraordinary gift. And as we gaze at Jesus in the manger, we do so in the shadow of the cross to come. And we're so grateful that you have redeemed us, God, through your Son. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we recognize that you have watched over us in this last year in so many ways, and we thank you for that. And we're also so mindful of the difficulties of this last year, how the darkness in many ways has been magnified in times of confusion and tensions and sickness and uncertainty, fear, anxiety, financial struggles. Thank you, God, that you are a constant in the midst of all of these wavering things. We can put our feet surely upon the rock that is Jesus Christ. We pray for those who are hurting this morning. We pray for those who are lonely, who are afraid, who are ill. God, would your presence and healing touch be upon them? Would you provide for each person, God, that they would have a sense of your loving care, especially now in this Advent season? Thank you that you watch over us with loving eyes and that you provide for our every need. And we are grateful, Lord, in your mercy. God, we thank you for our ministry partners around the world, and we pray especially that you would give them a taste of your goodness. That you would, at the end of this year, that you would provide for them and their very many needs. We thank you for the Twin Lakes Food Bank right here in town and the many, many hundreds of people that they serve every month to provide food and clothing, the things that are needed for those most at risk in our community. We pray for their director, Lisa Tudor. God, would you bless her and give her renewed strength and passion for the ministry you've called her to? And would you provide, raise up more volunteers, God, and provide a building for them as they seek to move to a bigger space? Would they see that happen in the first half of the next year? We also pray for churches gathered around Folsom this morning. God, we thank you for the larger body of Christ. 
And we pray that your spirit would be at work in their midst as they gather. We pray especially for Mount Olive Lutheran. God, you know what their needs are as they seek to encourage their congregation, to encourage the people who live around them, the community they serve. God, thank you that you are with them and uh, strengthen them, I pray, for their mission and their work. Lord, in your mercy. God, again, we thank you for your faithful provision to us, and we thank you for the privilege that we have to give back to you a portion. God, our tithes and our offerings, Lord, we just are grateful to you that we have this opportunity to give back to you as an extension of our worship. Would you give us glad and generous hearts in doing that? And would you take this offering and multiply these gifts, God, to advance your kingdom here on earth? Lord, we again are so grateful to you that we have the ability to gather here together in person and online. And we are thankful for this expression of the body of Christ at Oak Hills Church. Have your way in us, we pray, that we would be changed in this Advent time for your glory and your sake. In Jesus' name we all say, amen.
You reign over our hopes, over our fears, God, over our brokenness. Lord, you reign over our peace, God. We give you this morning. We give you the, our lives and are so thankful for you and your son. In your name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Are we awake? <laughs> good morning, everyone. <laughs> That's better. My name is Lorraine Rothenberg, and I'm one of the pastors here at Oak Hill. So glad that you're with us this morning, especially if you're visiting with us. Um, we'd love a chance to get to meet you. And hello, all of you watching online. Glad you're joining us as well this morning. Um, it's my privilege to share with you a few of the announcements of things that are coming up here in the life of our church. And the first one I want to mention is a little bit longer of an announcement. And this is um, our year-end offering. If you've been here for some time, you know that um, twice a year it's our custom to take a special offering. We do a mid-year offering and a year-end offering. And it's an over and above our regular giving offering that goes to fund various um, projects, initiatives, goals, and things like that that we have. And so um, this year our year-end offering is going to be going toward an outdoor renovation project. We already kind of started that a little bit with the courtyard. Um, and the shade cover there, we have more we want to do. And especially, we want to redo uh, the play yard. When you come up the front walk, you'll notice there's a children's play yard there outside our children's classrooms. And it is in desperate need of some really uh, better quality equipment and um, the material that goes on the ground, all of that. And that is um, a costly uh, initiative, but something we feel is really important. And we're excited about it both for... Uh, our church and the families in our church, but also we have a vision that that would become a place that our community can come to um, as a playground and play. Uh, families that are going to move into the apartments across the street could come over and use that, and it gives us a missional opportunity to connect with people in our neighborhood. And so we encourage you to pray about how um, God might have you participate in the year-end offering. And as always, we give 10% of whatever comes in away. And this year, we're going to be giving it to um, uh, Sean Young, who's part of it'll go to Inner Varsity and the ministry that he's involved of there, which is campus ministry all over the country. And so we're excited to get to partner with him in that as well. You can give online for that, or you can write a check. However you give, just make sure to notate that it's for the year-end offering. So we're excited about the possibilities that that comes with. Also, our Christmas Eve services are coming, and you want to pay special attention to this announcement because we're changing up the times a little bit. As we dreamt a little about how we might want to spend Christmas Eve together, uh, we thought about some changes that we'd like to make. And so our service times at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock are going to be more like a Sunday service. They'll be celebratory in nature and uh, just a wonderful time to gather together for a celebration, joyful service at 4 and 6. The 4 o'clock will be the one that we live stream. And then you can come back at 11.15 for a contemplative Christmas vigil. And we will usher in Christmas morning together in that reflective gathering. So you can come to one, you can come to all three, or you can come to one of the earlier ones. Our goal is you, if you want to come to a four and a six, it allows you some evening time with your family uh, and friends to gather for dinner and such. And then uh, we invite you to come back for this reflective service uh, at 11.15. So that's coming up. And then right after that, uh, that following Sunday, the 26th of December, will be a one service Sunday at 10 o'clock as will the following one on January 2nd. So mark your calendars that those two Sundays we're going to gather together all in one service as a church family at 10 o'clock. And the last announcement that I want to mention is with regard to the Heart Winter Shelter. Um, as some of you may know, we have been hosting for a number of years now um, the Winter Shelter for those in need of housing. And um, so that's going to happen here. We're going to host for the whole month of January. 
And we, Oak Hills, is going to staff it with our volunteers the first week of January. So we really need volunteers. We need people that can stay for overnight supervision, who can bring meals um, and greet, uh, various kinds of things. So you can find out how you can participate in that on our app, uh, online, on our website. You can contact the church office. And uh, as always, all of our announcements, you can find those on our website or on our app encourage you to check that out and again we're so glad you're here this morning Lorraine is remarkable at giving announcements she really is so she mentioned the year-end offering and in particular mentioned the 10% that we always give to an outside ministry, to someone that is uh, serving, sometimes overseas, sometimes local, but beyond the walls of our own church, we give away 10% of whatever comes in for the year-end offering that goes as an investment and as an encouragement to someone outside the wall. She mentioned that Sean Young, many of you know Sean, uh, this year we are giving that 10% to Sean and his work with InterVarsity and his work with us. So I want to give you a little bit of a picture of what Sean does and why we are excited to partner with him in this year-end offering. And so, uh, Sean, maybe uh, the best way to start is just to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how long you've been with InterVarsity. You've been there about 90 years, so maybe talk about all that stuff. <laughs> way to start me off with, yeah. a, with a jab. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been serving with InterVarsity for 30 years now, and uh, I was actually a college student involved with the organization. It had a huge impact on my life. Uh, just the, the opportunity to be part of a Christian community during my formative years yeah. in college is really one of the main reasons why Jesus means so much to me still today. Yeah, great. So give, give us a vision, a picture of what you actually do, what your work is with InterVarsity. Yeah, so... Uh, my full-time job with InterVarsity is to inspire and train and mobilize the 30,000 students and faculty and volunteers that we're working with to reach the unreached campuses across the U.S. And to give you a little perspective on that, uh, it may sound like 30,000 students is a big number, that's a lot of people, um, but there are uh, just about 5,000 institutes of higher learning in the U.S., we're serving 650 of those campuses. So, you know, maybe 12 or 13% of the total. And um, if you were to put together all of the major college ministries that are out there, so InterVarsity, Crew, Navigators, Chi Alpha, Southern Baptist, anything that's out there right now that, has, that provides ongoing ministry on campuses, if you pooled us all together, we're reaching 1,174 campuses out, out of the 5, total. 000. Yeah. So, you know, maybe 23%. Yeah. So just to, just to clarify that, 5,000 universities, schools in the United States, and, and we were talking about this the other day, we can pretty much safely say, in terms of an organized Christian witness on those campuses, 1,173 of them have one, and about 3,900 don't. It's a pretty remarkable number. Yeah. And so it's my job. I care about those campuses that okay. don't have any ongoing ministry. So, you know, like the girls that we saw in the family uh, here at the Woodards, the, their oldest, the second grader, I care that she finds a Christian community when she goes to college in 2030 or whenever that's yeah, going to be. Right. So uh, that's my job. And, you know, uh, one huge breakthrough that we've had is um, I've, I and a couple of other national leaders from InterVarsity have been meeting with our counterparts from CRU uh, initially and just praying with them and asking what, what might God help us to do together that we can't accomplish by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so for the first time in both of our organization's histories, we're working together to reach the whole 5,000. And as a result of that, 70 other ministries, so all the college, major college campus ministries, a lot of church denominations, um, and just several ministries have joined us, uh, 70 of them, uh, in this effort, in this initiative we call everycampus.com. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, the, the first thing that's happened is, uh, so far, 4,943, I think, uh, of those 5,000 campuses. So almost everyone has had at least one person go and visit and do a prayer walk as a first step towards establishing a ministry there. Wow. So your work is to, is to help students on these campuses and leaders um, find ways to cooperate with what God might be doing there and start something. Is yeah. That an accurate way of putting it? Yeah. Give us a picture, an example. Um, yeah. Help us see that more clearly. Yeah. So uh, I'm, we're just going to set up a, a short video here is that um, Katie and Socorro from Cal State Bakersfield, a little south here in uh, California, were two students who just had a sense that God uh, wanted to do something at a campus several miles from them at a uh, small community college where uh, Socorro, one of the girls, uh, grew up. And it was her hometown. And so uh, let's just watch that and then we'll kind of react. Yep. I'm Socorro Darrington, and I go to CSUB. During listening prayer, I just felt like a really huge call for Delano campus. And I felt like he just said, just go. I saw her praying, and she told me that she wanted to make a commitment and to just go to Delano. So I just kind of wanted to go and support her and um, made that commitment with her. So we started making trips to Delano once a week. The first few weeks we would go for a few hours a week and hand out snacks and get phone numbers of people. Each of us combined had like 70 numbers. So we were really excited about that, but then when we actually had our first Bible study, um, it wasn't 70 people. <laughs> we had two people. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little disappointing to be putting in effort and having this belief that um, God is working on this campus. So we were kind of disappointed, a little bit like, God, why, why are there only two people? So because we were feeling so frustrated and having questions, we did not know what to do next. But we met Jamie uh, over a video conference call, and every week we were able to talk about what we were facing, what we thought Jesus was doing. So tell me a little bit about Tuesday. Um, so Jamie told us to revise our plan. So instead of just having Bible studies, we decided to do outreach and invite people to join us for a Bible study and ask people their spiritual experiences using that faith survey card. And Jesus, we asked that we would see revival break through at Delano. Pray this in your name. Amen. So then we went to Delano with a new mindset and with our surveys. He spoke with this guy named Angel. We handed him the spiritual survey and he thought it was really cool and it turns out he was a mixture, a blend of three. He was curious, he was open, and he was seeking God. And after a short conversation, um, Angel's eyes just like lit up. When they asked me where I was in my faith, um, I didn't know how to answer that. When I went to the, the first Bible study, I wasn't really too sure how to, how to pray or, or anything really. I didn't know what to expect. I had never been to a Bible study before. But when I showed up, we started reading the prodigal son and some of this stuff was just like, like I can relate to this. Like this could be me. I could come back and he's gonna welcome me with open arms. I asked him the question, well, are you ready to make that commitment and he said you know what yeah I am ready I just told her like if if this is the joy that it's gonna bring me then yes like bring it on I'm ready Yeah, so uh, this is one of our initiatives where we train students how to reach out. So, so uh, Katie and Socorro didn't even have a car 
to drive out to Delano from Bakersfield, so they had to rope in another student from their current Bible study to who had a go car. with it, who had a car. <laughs> And, wow. uh, and they just went once a week. And, and uh, that guy, Angel, actually is, was on the uh, uh, wrestling team. So he ended up inviting the entire wrestling team to his Bible study. He invited three of his classes, stood wow. up in front of three of his classes. Wow. And he said afterwards, I wish I was taking more classes because I'd invite them all. You know? Wow, that is awesome. So this is what you do at InterVarsity in our language here. It's very missional, very beyond the walls trying to reach and extend to people who don't know who Jesus is. So about a year or so ago, I don't remember how long it was, maybe a year and a half, you came on starting to work here with Oak Hills to help us in our adventure in mission. So my question is, that's what you do at InterVarsity. What are you seeking to do as we are on this journey? What are you trying to do here? What's your role here? It's really the same thing uh, because... You know, going back to the college world, every student is connected to different um, communities, to different networks on their campus. And so it might be uh, one of their classes, it might be a theater club, it might be some other thing that they're involved with. But uh, they have all these relational networks that they're connected to, and we're just helping them see that God could create a kingdom environment in any one of those spaces. Mm -hmm. And Jesus could come and reign there. And, and he could use you to do that, to make that happen. And so that's what inspires them. I see it's really that the, the university is just a microcosm of a city. And it's really the same thing for us, that God could use us. And there, the, the places where we're already connected um, in, in the city, in our daily lives, yeah. could be kingdom spaces that are just waiting to happen. Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's really what, this series is about, and you've heard this if you've been around a bit, we've been emphasizing this over and over again, and just to put a different picture in your mind, what you watched with these two students on the screen is what Sean and Dave Holcomb and others are seeking to lead us in here because what those two students are doing are what Christians are called to do. And so I would look at it this way, that we're watching two people who are hopefully setting an example for us being leaders of us in the spaces we go, how do we go as they did, prayerfully and on mission to interact with others? And Sean's role with us is to help us learn how to do that. So there's a group of people that are already meeting with Sean every other week, people who have heard this talked about in this setting or seen things like this and thought, you know what? That sparked something in my own heart about my own self being living on mission and I want to learn more about that and I want to begin to process with others and with Sean and see what God might be doing in my neighborhood in my workplace in my school as I seek to live on mission so we have things going already if that something in all this is curious to you Sean would be someone to talk to and he can give you more information on what we're trying to do so what I wanted you to see today is Part of what we're doing in this year-end offering is trying to upgrade the outside of our campus for various reasons. But another part that is going to happen is students like that, that Sean works with all over the country, by our helping to support Sean, he gets to support them and the kingdom expands all around. So thank you, Sean, for sharing. Thanks. Would you stand for our scripture reading today? It will be on the screen. It is Luke 24, verses 28 through 32. For those of you that like to follow the, look at the screen and see notes and quotes and other things up there, this is the only thing you're going to see today, so I hate to disappoint you, but that's all there's going to be. Luke 24, and I'm going to read verses 28 through 32. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road 
and opened the scriptures to us. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. The story is a post-resurrection story. It happens just a few moments or a few hours after Jesus has risen from the grave. And I find vision and a hope for the culture today, a vision and a hope for the church today, and a vision and a hope for you and for me today in this short passage. And all of it wraps into this rather simple idea of people in relationship with each other on a journey of discovering Jesus, and he is right there in their midst, helping them sort it out as they go. I think this weekend that we are wrapping up today and tonight has been a wonderful example, frankly, of this vision set forth in this passage and this vision of discovering Jesus together. This weekend has been a wonder, wonderful example of this vision in action for our church here at Oak Hills. Last night, as Manuel mentioned, we had our Advent festival and it was an absolute blast to be here. Nothing brings life and energy and hope like children living fully and without edits. It's just a beautiful thing to be part of. I got it out of my car. I started walking up here last night when I got here, and Robin Wells, uh, Jordan's wife, was walking up. Her two boys were in front of her, and their little daughter, Georgia, was next to her, and Robin was carrying this big bucket of chili, and she was go walking like this, turned to the side, and she's walking about this fast. Because Georgia had her hand under the vat of chili, and they're walking about like this. And I said, Robin, is Georgia helping you carry that? She goes, yeah, she's helping me carry it. And it was just this beautiful picture of walking up. Georgia's in charge. Georgia's setting the pace. She showed me the tiger she was carrying, how her boots lit up. And before I even got here, I thought, this is the beauty of children. They bring life and energy and vitality. And as you well know, they have this absolutely unbelievable gift when they live fully and without edits, which they always do, of irresistibly inviting those of us who are a little bit older to once again be like children. And that's what was happening on this campus from about 5 until 8 last night, and it was an absolute blast. It was a great evening of gathering, of building relationship, of laughing together, in some cases having meaningful conversations, and in some cases being able to meet new people. And now we gather here today, this morning, to worship God and to celebrate at His table. And then tonight, our youth group will do the same. And soon we will then be sent as people to go live on mission in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces and in our schools. It's been a wonderful weekend. And as I mentioned already, we've been talking about this mission piece for several weeks now in this series. In particular, we've been talking about our homes as a missional outpost, a place where mission can happen. And to kind of get us into that space today, I'd like for all of us, young and old, to just look at the communion table for the next couple of minutes. Just fix your eyes on this table, and even as you see this table, let your mind also see the other tables in your life. So as you see the communion table, maybe you think also of your kitchen table. Or maybe you have a dining room and there's a table in there. Or maybe you have a table in your backyard. Or maybe there is a table in the cafeteria where you regularly eat. Or at a restaurant you regularly visit. Just thinking about the table. See, when we gather as Christ followers, like we are today, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Jesus himself is the host of that table. And he invites us, those who are his brothers and sisters, he invites us to come and to sit and to eat and to encounter him at his table where he is the host. When we gather, however, at the tables in our homes, we are the host. And following Jesus' example and footsteps, we invite others to come and sit and eat and encounter Jesus at our tables. And so today, as we continue our series 
on our homes as a place or a space for mission. I want to talk about this table and how this table extends to our tables as one practical way for us to live on mission in and through our homes. For most of church history, the Lord's Supper, or the practice of communion, it is sometimes called, has been the undisputed centerpiece of Christian worship. One of the few givens of what it means to be the church is to come together and celebrate the Lord's table. And throughout history, Christ followers have been shaped, recalibrated, reminded by his table. Powerful and transformative things happen when we gather at the table of Jesus. God's story of putting the world, this broken world, back together is retold at this table. A space is opened for reconciliation and forgiveness to break out in our relationship with God and in our relationship with one another. Our identity as his people is reaffirmed when we come to this table. We encounter the living, present, resurrected Jesus at this table. We gather as God's family, brothers and sisters, at his table. So the table is a visual reminder of our life together in Christ and with each other. And at this table, obviously, we thank him for sacrificing his life for our sins, which is why communion, the Lord's table, is sometimes called the Eucharist. It's a Greek word. It means thanksgiving. So the table is where the great thanksgiving, people giving thanks to God for what he has done for them. But I would suggest to you what happens at this table does not stay at this table or is not supposed to stay at this table. The encounter at this table, I would suggest to you, is to extend to the other tables in our lives. This past Friday night, in the sprawling metropolis of Lodi, California, a few of us from Oak Hills attended a meeting with a few other people from a few other churches in the area. And when we first arrived, a group of us gathered in a room around a big circular table. And sitting at this table were a nurse, two therapists, a communications expert, a business person, and three pastors. At that table were both men and women. There were those in their 50s, 40s, and 30s. Some at the table had younger children. Some at the table had uh, older and grown children. And some at the table had no children. Some who were sitting there were feeling good physically. At least one who was sitting there had an aching back. Another had a torn ACL and was awaiting surgery. We didn't talk about it, but I'm sure sitting there, there were some Republicans. We didn't talk about it, but I'm sure sitting there, there were some Democrats. Some of us knew each other, but mostly we had just kind of met. We attend different churches, work different jobs, are in different life situations, but all of us are followers of Jesus Christ stumbling along the narrow road that leads to his life and goodness, and we ate together at this table. We told stories for a while. We laughed. We shared a bit of our life and history with each other. I don't want to overstate what happened or turn it into this exaggerated sort of postcard moment. It was a meal before a long meeting. But it was more than that. We had gathered in this home on that evening to talk about the church, local churches, and talk about mission in today's world. So there was an intentionality in our gathering from the get-go, and that impacted our time around this table. There was, however small or incremental, a shaping that occurred by being at the table with others who are on a similar journey and share a similar intention. When we were at the table, our titles and roles and jobs and gender and ethnicity and age 
All those things that so often define us and give us our identity, they dissolved. And instead, we were a group of sisters and brothers who loved God and were seeking to love Him more and discover fresh ways to help others encounter Him. And similar to how the table, this table, is the centerpiece of Christian worship and essential to what it means to be the church, the table is often a symbol and centerpiece of a family. In the house in Lodi, it most certainly was. A big, round table in a big, round room. It was like the Oval Office with the big, circular table in it. It was evident our time on Friday night at this table was not the first time people had gathered there for food and laughter and love and sharing. The table is where a family gathers. It is where love is expressed through food and conversation and relationship. It is where family business sometimes happens. It's where stories are told. And let's be real, sometimes arguments happen at the table of a family. And occasionally, arguments get sorted out at the table of a family. At the table, the field is leveled, we might say. The roles and the pecking order kind of fades away, and we are simply with one another as a family. So let's come back to this table for a second. You and I are constantly pressured and influenced in our lives to find our identity in the roles we fulfill, in the titles we have, and in the, the accomplishments we have attained and are pursuing. Life bombards us to find our identity in these things. And gathering at this table realigns us. We come to this table and we remember our identity as his beloved sons and daughters and as members of his family at this local church, which is part of his big church. And the titles and the roles and the ethnicity and the age and the experience and the color and all the rest of it is fades and the field is level. So we can rightly say a social and psychological reordering happens at this table. Let me say that a bit stronger. A social and psychological undercutting of cultural norms happens at this table. We are not what we do. We are not what we accomplish. We are not the master of our own lives. And we are not alone. God is our Father. Jesus is our King. The Holy Spirit is our companion and our counselor. And we are His people. And this is reality for Christian people. Not an idea. Not a, even a teaching. This is reality. This is the new reality for anybody who professes to be a follower of Jesus. Their identity is redone, and we remember that when we come to the table. And this upside-down ethic where things are turned over and flipped around, this ethic of the kingdom of God gets played out and put on display when we come to the table. Imagine for a moment a dinner party on a Friday night in, suburb, in a suburb of Rome in the year 21 AD. They happened. They did these things. In a typical first century Roman dinner party or banquet, here's how it worked. Rich and privileged men would invite other rich and privileged men to an evening of food and drink and conversation about important subjects. The servants would serve, the women would gather in a different room altogether because they weren't considered qualified to be at the table with the men. The children were even less qualified, so they would either be with the women wherever they were or in another area by themselves. The poor would never even be invited because this was an exclusive gathering. It was like a country club where if you didn't have a membership, you couldn't just stroll in and sit down. At a Roman banquet table in the first century, um, each man sat in a spot 
that reflected the pecking order of importance, where they stood uh, where the, uh, in term, uh, relative to the other men. And the one closest to the host had the most status and was deemed the most important. So when these banquets would happen, one of the motivators for the men who would come would be to, with each passing one, get a little bit closer to the host because then you were a little bit more important. So this Friday night in a Roman, Roman suburb, circa 21 AD, was organized around the ethics of privilege, status, power, and importance. A gathering for insiders, and outsiders need not attend. Well, the last supper Jesus had with his disciples and the subsequent church practice of the Lord's Supper was patterned after one of these Roman banquets, except at Jesus' table, the ethics of the kingdom of God reordered and revamped the social dynamics of the day. So it was a subversive meal, as one author puts it. It was a meal, a practice that undercut cultural norms. Remember in John 13, at the Last Supper, in the upper room, the host of the meal, Jesus, the power broker of the banquet, the one everybody wanted to get the closest to because he was the host, he gets up and he washes the feet of his guests. Well, that's what servants were supposed to do, and as soon as they did it, they were supposed to leave and go back to where they belonged. At the Last Supper... The invited guests were just ordinary dudes, most of them poor, ordinary dudes. They were not elite in any way. Sitting at Jesus' table at the Last Supper was a guy who was conspiring to kill him, and another who would soon deny even knowing him, and Jesus, the host, knew both of these things, but he invited and welcomed and washed the feet of these men, even so. You feel this? How countercultural this is? How subversive this is? So at his table, Jesus turns the ethics of the culture upside down. At his table, titles, roles, privileges, and status markers fade. At his table, we wake back up to the reality that we are his daughters and we are his sons, and we are members of his family, and this is the beginning, and this is the end of our identity. Alan Street, in a book called Subversive Meals, puts it this way. He says, if anyone wanted to know what the kingdom of God was like, all they had to do was attend a Christian communal banquet. There they would encounter an alternative way of life where all people regardless of the status assigned to them by Rome, practiced fully as equals in the meal. Around the meal table, believers forged an identity as being in Christ. As such, they were now being fashioned into a new body politic which represented the kingdom of God. And this idea, these ideas, are absolutely crucial in the life of Oak Hills Church. We as a community are to be an example of the alternative way of the kingdom, the way we relate to each other, the way we see one another, the way we treat one another, the way we lead one another, the way we follow, is to be upside down from the way it's done in the culture. We then are to put the kingdom of God on display through our life Together, or say it this way, we are to be an embassy of God's kingdom right here in the midst of messy earth. So, blacks and whites and female and male and white collar and blue collar and rich and poor and less abled and able and old and young and Democrats and Republicans and liberals and conservatives humbly gather at Jesus' table. Now hear this. As brothers and sisters who are members 
of God's family. And faithfulness to Jesus and the constant elevation of him as king and the one to whom we bow hold us together in spite of our differences. And when this happens, this displays the way of the kingdom to a world addicted to fracture, friction, division, and separation. So our scripture from Luke chapter 24, it occurs just hours after the resurrection. These two companions are walking the seven miles from Jerusalem to the nearby village of Emmaus. And as they're walking, they're recapping the amazing and tragic and confusing events that happened in Jerusalem over the previous weekend. As they walked and talked, Luke says, the risen Jesus joined them. But these two companions, Luke says, were kept from recognizing him. As the three of them now walked on together, these two, talking about what happened in Jerusalem to this guy Jesus, don't recognize this guy Jesus is walking along with them. And Jesus asked them what they were talking about. And an important conversation occurs between the three of them. And we come to verse 28 that says, As they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus continued on as he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he began to give it to them. And Luke says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he disappeared from their sight and they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? You get that? The band, this band of three end up in a home eating together at a table. And while they are there, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. Sound familiar? His last supper table, where the kingdom was displayed and a new social order was enacted, has just been extended to this home at the end of this strange day. And these three companions, two who know each other, but they don't know the third, sit down for a meal at the end of a long day and long weekend. And when Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, something profound happened. Something, dare I say it, miraculous happened. They recognized the presence of Jesus in their home, at their table, in this meal. Their eyes, Luke says, were opened and they recognized him. They remembered the conversation they were having with him on the road earlier in the day and Luke describes their reaction. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. They sensed something about him even before they recognized him. There was something compelling about him and their hearts burned, longed, ached. And when he entered their home, he took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to them saying, gave it to them and their eyes were open and they recognized who he was. This is the Lord's table extended in a home where people who are gathered around a table for a meal encounter Jesus and become aware of his presence. So when we talk about our homes as an outpost for mission, you may be thinking, what on earth are you talking about? That seems so ethereal, so gooey. Not sure what it means. Well, here's one of the things it means. We believe our tables can be a place where the presence of Jesus can be discerned, encountered, and experienced, especially in this fast-paced, fractured, divided, and increasingly lonely world. Or put it this way, is it possible that what happened on the road to Emmaus and in that home was more than a one-time event in the life of these two friends? Is it possible there's something transferable to us? Is it possible this idea of the Lord's table 
can be extended to our tables. So our table in our home can be a place where people gather and people eat and people share and Jesus himself is present and something real and something meaningful happens. Luke says in verse 35, Then the two told the other disciples what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So imagine the four movements of the Lord's Supper. Taking bread, giving thanks, breaking bread, and sharing bread occurring in our homes as we gather with those who know Jesus and with those who don't know Jesus. You see, we're walking out to a bold edge right here. Imagine being there with those who know him and those who don't. So our table becomes a place and a space where we learn how to discern the presence of Jesus. And what if, over time, by God's grace and spirit, those gathered there have their eyes opened to who he is? Is that possible? Could God work through something as simple and unspectacular as a meal with others in our table, at our table, in our home? Let me put it this way. Is it possible in five years someone, somewhere, is telling a story of meeting Jesus for the first time five years ago in your home, at your table, over a meal? has such an Advent quality to it, doesn't it? Jesus coming to be with us, the incarnation. God putting on human flesh and this wonderful word dwelling among us, being with us in the everyday aspects of our lives, like at dinner, around a table, as we take, give thanks, break, and share food and learn how to tend to his presence and trust he's at work on our table. Living on mission. We're talking about it a lot. Conducting some experiments in mission because the world is lost and needs Jesus Christ. Just like these two in this video. They wanted to share this good news with people who didn't know him. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about living on mission. Here we're talking about extending the table of Jesus into our homes and inviting those who don't know him to join us. And we pray with others about our table and we see if God does something. No forcing, no pushing, no moment when we say, now i am got you here, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. So we're going to handcuff you to the chair so you can't leave. And then I'm going to tell you about this. None of that. Just gentle courage to follow the Spirit's lead with confidence Jesus is present and wants to be seen and known by those who currently don't see or know him. Well, this is going to be something we're talking about uh, for quite some time. Matter of fact, we have a plan. It will be enacted in January, February, and March. Dave and Ashley and others are working on it as we speak. And the plan is to encourage and find a way to get a number of us to host a meal at our table and invite others to those tables. Some that we invite who know Jesus, maybe some we invite who don't. We don't program it, we don't manufacture it, we don't force it. We step into that believing if the communion table extends to our table and Jesus is present, who knows? what might happen. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, we accept your invitation to come to your table, broken as we are, conflicted as we are, different as we are. And I continue to want to pray this into the DNA of Oak Hills, that we would revel, celebrate, be glad for, and protect our many differences that we would recognize that in those differences, you have the chance to teach us how to submit those things 
to you and be in submission to each other. And there, your power can break out and hold us together when everything perhaps in us and certainly in these cultural times would say, run away and go find a group that sees it the way you see it. So I pray beyond just today that we would increasingly be a people that recognize our differences are an opportunity for your power to bring forth unity, and in doing so, we demonstrate to the world the alternative way of your kingdom. Help us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come to the table today, hopefully it doesn't need a whole lot of setup, but we come here recognizing that Jesus Christ himself is the host of this table, and he invites all who are his followers or who would like to be his followers to come to this table and to receive from him. So we invite you, if you are a follower of Christ, in a moment, uh, because of various reasons, we will be celebrating the table uh, from our seats. Hopefully you got communion elements when you came in. If you did not, raise your hand. There are ushers around who will bring them to you. There's one back there, Clayton, as well, right in the middle. <clears throat> Keep your hand up till someone brings it to you. You'll also notice on the screens we have our communion liturgy that helps us prepare for the Lord's table and puts us into a space of readiness to receive. I want you to recognize as we do this, just imagine that circular room that I was in on Friday night, that kind of round room with a round table. We got the round room thing going, not quite the round table, but you get the point. As we look across this room, and this was a, a part of our intention in setting the room this way, when you look across this room, you are looking at a brother or a sister in Jesus Christ. You are looking at someone who is part of the family that you are part of, where God is our Father, Jesus is our King, and the Holy Spirit is our companion and our counselor. And there are differences galore, not only in how we look, but in all sorts of other things. And those differences fade away when we come in the power and presence of Jesus to be with him and to be with one another. So we celebrate this meal today as Christians have done since Christianity began. We come to celebrate the Lord's table. He is our host, and he invites us to it. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'll give you a moment of silent preparation as we joyfully and thankfully prepare to come to this table. If you'd give your attention to the screen. <clears throat> The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. We praise you, almighty God, for into the desert wilderness a voice of hope called us to prepare for your arrival, just as your prophets foretold. In repentance and obedience, many listened and turn their hearts toward you in the days of old. Today, help us to heed the voice that speaks into our own dry and rebellious places and use this Advent season to make straight paths back to your heart. In hope and expectation of this divine coming, we praise you, joining our voices with the angels and all of creation and with all those you have redeemed from every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Faithful, good, and worthy, full of grace and truth, blessed be your name, mighty God. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, 
your Son, our Lord. We await with expectation the promised baptism of fire and spirit that your worthy and powerful Son brings to us. In this season of gifts, we recall the perfect gift of your Son to this world, bringing hope to all who trust you. And at this table, we rejoice that even in our waiting to see you in the flesh, we can meet you here. Please prepare us to receive you and nourish our faith with these elements. On the night Jesus was betrayed, arrested, and sentenced to death, he took bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take this and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. If you would take your element and your little bread slash wafer. Just simply hold it in your hand for a second. Remembering the sacrifice of our Lord for you. The rearranging of who you are by our Lord that you might be his beloved son, his beloved daughter, that his love for you extended to the cross the grave, and the empty tomb. All so that you and I and we might be his people reflecting his kingdom. With gratitude, let's take and eat. When supper was over, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this and drink it. For this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. If you would take your cup and with great thanksgiving, let us drink together. And as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. May our lives be resurrection lives, always proclaiming the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come.
as you leave today, my prayer is that you will know in an experiential way that if you have put your confidence in Jesus Christ, then God is your Father. Jesus is your King and your Savior. The Holy Spirit is your companion and your counselor, and you are his beloved. And you are a member of his family. God is your Father. Jesus is your Savior and your King. The Holy Spirit is your companion and your counselor. And you, you are his beloved. And so as you leave here today, may you go in the strength, in the knowledge, in the confidence, and in the identity of knowing who you are, knowing what reality now is as his beloved daughter or his beloved son. And as you go, may the peace of Christ be with you all. Thanks for being here today.